What's so, look today? Thank you. Are you going to space? Okay, I can't hear you now. All right. Are we good? Uh, are we mostly good? Down. We're mostly good? Tap your mic. Okay, yes, sir. Okay. I, can, I can see levels on the page. It's good enough. Just talk loud. I gotta do my. We're good, we're good, we're good. Jay says that we're good. <laughs> Sorry for the delay, folks. Uh, again, John with RMUS, uh, we're just doing a little bit of a show about the hydrogen kind of development and drone. So um, I guess uh, just after a bit of confirmation here, again, apologize for the delay, but as well, we wanna just make sure everybody is logged in, watching the show. Uh, if you have any questions during this time, is to go ahead and type those out. Uh, we don't have really a voice uh, kind of questioning time, but uh, Jace, my moderator, as well as uh, uh, the king on the uh, cameras today, will be assisting us in helping with questions as we're moving throughout this webinar. So uh, hopefully everything goes well and uh, you guys have plenty of questions during this time. And I uh, want to briefly explain about uh, kind of those developments. So how are we looking there, Jace? Uh, enough people, questions? Are you monitoring it on your end there, Jace? Yeah, I'm getting there. Mm-hmm. Almost there. Very good. So again, I, they, I just wanted to tell everybody thank you for joining us and uh, the future webinars that we have is a lot of this is very informational. Uh, in some cases, we're doing actual ed education, showing people how things work, what they do. Join us on our educational portal uh, to see a lot of the, d the videos that we develop and as well as curriculum that we've made specific to the industry to kind of help people move forward, make good business decisions when they're purchasing, looking at, again at education and learning a little bit more about what you guys do every day. So uh, uh, make sure you join us with that. Uh, on top of that, uh, I have actually already done a webinar, uh, kind of a video initially about hydrogen and how hydrogen might actually develop into where it could be the actual energy choice of uh, using pro for propulsion on some of these systems. Uh, the big thing about hydrogen is that it, uh, you know, as far as the tanks go and their capability, you can pack more and more and more into this size. Whereas when we're talking about lithium polymer batteries, the only way we can do anything with these is to make them exponentially larger to then be used as energy on the drone. So these, if they get larger, obviously the ship needs to get larger. But the nice thing about possible future developments in hydrogen is that this is a 350 bar tank. What if this tank could hold 650 bar? What if we're able to stack even more hydrogen molecules into a space and still not change how much this actually weighs. It's very neg negligible. This tank is actually 11.2 pounds. That's how much this one weighs. And then with the power unit that's on, on top of the uh, Doosan that we're gonna de demonstrate today, that's another 12 pounds. So we're talking 20, 27 pounds, whereas the same equivalent, equ equivalent of battery is about the same. We're at 27 pounds for just batteries. These will keep me flying on, on that size ship that, we, that we're gonna see today for probably about 18 to 20 minutes, uh, carrying five to 10 pounds, maybe. Whereas the Doosan can do 10 pounds for about an hour and a half on a carried pay weight. So we're talking power density being squished. We're talking about that capability of, of moving forward in development to maybe even make these smaller with more molecules. Fuel cells then converting the hydrogen over to electricity. Electricity then maintaining how the bird needs to, uh, keeping the bird in flight. And then, uh, you know, additionally, the, the big one about hydrogen is, and the big 
bad thing is 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 how people are like oh my god is that hydrogen how dangerous how dangerous that stuff is it's actually not very dangerous overall is it flammable absolutely i mean it is but even if you crash an actual machine that's got a lithium polymer battery gasoline uh, jet fuel whatever it is you likely are going to flame up with something so hopefully the tank doesn't burst and and explode and uh, the good thing about Dusan in development is that they've done a lot of tests for that for uh, possible crash damage uh, to not allow any of the energy or the molecules or anything else to be released from the tank but uh, that's always been a, uh, one of the bigger things is people commenting of how dangerous the hydrogen is. And I think after we start to find out 15 years ago, lithium polymer were also very dangerous and still cause fires and issues today if you're not taking care of them. Same hazards and same things are gonna happen here. So we wanna kinda keep that in mind. So um, again, we talk about developments uh, and why. Why hydrogen uh, and, and we just kinda outlined that. But then as we look at the ships that are available today and why, why are we going down this road? What is the, what is the reason? One, duration of time. Uh, we want to be able to fly a long time. Uh, whether that's beyond visual line of sight or not doesn't really matter, but we do want to fly for a very long time and possibly long distances if that comes into play. But the main thing is not having to come down and change batteries back up, back down, change batteries back up, back down. It does uh, logistically become a little bit more complicated when you're talking about trying to move around 100 batteries for an operation that's happening. So I do really do, do think it's, it's going down there. We've also seen other developments in the actual ships rather than the power system. So between fixed wing and helicopter, now to multi-rotor, a mix of the two. Now we've got VTOL systems that are taking off, flying for a long duration of time on the wings. Boy, if we could actually twist, change those into a hydrogen type operation with a fuel cell, I mean, we're talking, could be up for days, who knows, that you could have a, a system that's a small UAS and not a, a million dollars or two flying around and doing stuff that, uh, collecting data uh, and doing real stuff like that. So it, it, it's definitely a development that's going down the road. Um, just again, generally hi highlighting a little bit about the hydrogen and how it works, but I want to go ahead and introduce uh, J.T. Von Lunen, uh, the president of RMUS, and kind of yeah. talk, talk talk a little bit about the, the, the Dusan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Make sure we have keep our, our social distance. Well, you still yeah. have to get in close enough okay, for, for yeah. you to get in the camera. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I wish everybody out there could see the, the operation. operation. I apologize we're a little late, but there is a lot going on here. We have five different lights around us, a whole switchboard, mics. I hope you can hear me okay. So, the, uh, you know, we've tried to make these uh, better for the audience uh, with better sound quality, lighting, uh, and, you know, content. John does a great job. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, um, yeah. Dusan. Hi Dusan Hydrogen technology for years now. Uh, a lot of it is, you know, very uh, early and experimental, but the reason we went with Dusan is because they have a product that is pretty much production ready. They have uh, the hydrogen distribution ready to go in the United States. Uh, they also have been testing this. This tank is actually um, rated for uh, the pressure and for a drop, I think, of about uh, over 600 feet, 500 feet. Mm -hmm. um, also, they're shooting it with ballistics. So, that was my main concern, uh, you know, looking at RMUS, putting our liability on the line here. Is this going to work? Yes. Um, it's been tested over and over again for uh, the safety features. Um, second of all, Dusan is a very large Korean company. They own uh, Bobcat. You've probably seen those on job sites uh, with, you know, heavy equipment. So they've put a lot of resources and development into making this, uh, you know, technology available. One thing that we wanted to let you know today is you're going to see the Dusan uh, hydrogen fuel cell on top of an airframe. Um, we really wanted to present to you, and I think John's done a good job explaining, this webinar is more about showing the uh, capabilities of the hydrogen fuel cell and where the technology is going. Um, that's part of what we do at RMUS for our you know, customer base is go out and find these innovative uh, you know, new technologies. We're making the investment into finding these and working with the companies to develop these. Um, we're working with other uh, manufacturers to put these on certain airframes. Um, and so this is, uh, just remember that if you see the drone flying, it's more about, you know, what we're trying to do with the hydrogen fuel cells. And maybe you have some ideas out there, or you're, you're making your own aircraft, that this might be a power source. So there are, um, you know, economies of scale to kind of push these down. 
But what really helps once you get a product out in the market is having you know, the market buy it and you know, keep making those type of improvements. So um, it's actually very affordable. Um, you can contact our salespeople for uh, pricing. Um, and you know, range, you know, definitely under $80,000. Has been how long has Doosan been messing around with this? Uh, we've been fuel working cell. with them for the, the fuel, fuel cells. Well, they've been doing fuel cells for over 10 years in a, a variety of uh, different industries. Uh, they took us on a tour in South Korea mm -hmm. of their fuel cell factory where they're all they have stacks that power uh, small, uh, you know, apartments mm -hmm. um, that they're using. Sorry, mm -hmm. I keep going off screen here. John's <laughs> helping me. Um, so yes, they've got they've had a lot of technology behind this, but they also see the benefits in the UAV world, like John mentioned. Um, this is a pretty big tank, I gotta admit. But you know, as the technology improves, we're probably gonna get smaller. But what's out there right now is able to power uh, an aircraft, uh, a little more sizable one. But the flight times that we've been getting are an hour and a half to two hours with you know ten pounds of payload, depending on the the uh, elevation that you're mm -hmm. flying at. So um, I think that uh, you know we want to you know continue to show you innovative things on these webinars. Uh, hopefully you can get something out of this. We're going to have some other ones coming up in the next few weeks that have some you know, new products, new innovations. Are they ready for market yet? This one is. Um, and the couple of ones that we're working on are you know, just kind of giving you guys ideas out there of how you can use these products because that's you know, what mm -hmm. we like to do and, and yeah. help you out. So uh, I'll let you keep going, John. Thank um, you. Yeah. Uh, social distance. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good job. Thank you, JT. Uh, always uh, a pleasure to actually work with JT on a lot of these innovative technologies, pushing forward uh, both uh, us as a company, um, my crew, uh, and like I said, the last webinar I had a great, we had a great webinar with the crew giving all kinds of input. We definitely dive deep into the technology, trying to understand it, uh, make sure that we're giving uh, that great input not only to people that are going to buy it, but also back to the manufacturers for further improvement and development. So uh, I don't know if we've had any questions so far, Jace. Um, nothing yet. Nobody, nobody bugging us yet, <laughs> if you will. No. Okay. So uh, um, anyway, let's go take a look outside. We're going to jump outside real quick. Uh, my technician, Lance Stoddard, is uh, going to go ahead and kind of uh, give us an overall, not necessary talk, but kind of give us the uh, where and what and how and uh, everything there is about this uh, ship. So uh, let's head outside. Uh, I'm thinking that you can still hear my audio. Do we want the other wrist? Okay, very go. good. <clears throat> you just bring it over. All right, one of the things that uh, JT kind of uh, talked about uh, overall was the not getting stuck on this, on this actual ship and the size of it, the, what it is and everything else, but the fact that this weighs 25 pounds, that's the tank, that's the fuel cells, that's the, the power system. Um, once we add all of that together, we, we do need a ship large enough to carry just that portion plus an additional payload on top of that. And Lance, he has been uh, my uh, kind of sole uh, technician on this one, helping out both uh, Dusan and, and kind of talking about it. So uh, let's just lift this up just a little bit so people can see it from the front. Of just, I mean, we can see it's pretty large, but let's just move that up a little bit. And we can see it's, it's a pretty big bird. Uh, she runs 28 inch props. Uh, we're pretty impressed on the flight time. Definitely. Yeah. <clears throat> and although this looks so large, the airframe itself is actually very, very light. Yeah, so it, it Lance had just said, I don't, he's not mic'd up, but it is a very large, very light airframe uh, uh, in comparison to a lot of the other airframes that we have either built or messed with over the years, huh? Definitely. Yeah. For well, its size. For how big it is. So. Uh, definitely, those guys developing this, uh, this, the one thing about it, it, it can, again, we don't want to get caught up too much on the actual airframe, but, I mean, being able to fold these arms in, fold the props out, uh, really a cool development on this one. Let's get a little bit closer to this. So, we're going to go back inside and actually take a look at what the hydrogen cell is, is producing as far as monitoring goes. But, again, the fuel uh, cell just runs here, or the fuel tank 
the hydrogen tank pushed into the front. There's a connection in the back. We'll show you a little bit of this inside. Uh, we have monitoring LEDs on the back end to make sure that it's, it's working the way it should. And uh, as well, when we get it up in the air, it is producing a pretty stable, flat amount of voltage. We're not seeing like we typically do in lithium polymer. We're not watching a degrading amount of voltage over time as we're using, right? This thing is just pushing out voltage until the last molecule of hydrogen is gone. Yep, you're, you're still seeing about the 50 volts the entire flight. 50 time. volts, pretty much maintains 50 volts. And so it will until the tank runs out. Until the tank runs out, that's right. Okay, so uh, just a little bit about this, but let's show a, a video, um, just because we're a little tight here and as well uh, where we're going to fly this thing. We'll show a video of it actually operating this thing, but then Lance, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and have you disassemble it and bring it back inside and we'll talk a little bit more about this portion of the power system. So let's go ahead and head back inside. ship. So uh, overall, uh, pretty awesome video of that going. Uh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> uh, we do want to we do want to definitely show in uh, further webinars actually this one performing different uh, systems we can put on there. But during this video, if, if we uh, had that plane there, Jace, that uh, that we basically have a uh, uh, capable, more than capable ship uh, to fly and uh, get up there in the flight time. Uh, nice thing about that is, like I said, I sent uh, a couple of the guys over there to take a look at, work with, and uh, get kind of an overall feel of uh, how this Doosan and uh, that company was going to be. So uh, as JT had highlighted, that uh, they've already been working on fuel, sec uh, fuel cell technology for 10 years and uh, pretty excited about that. So uh, Jace, I wanted to cut over to the uh, hydrogen Produ production screen, if that's okay. Uh, basically, before Lance disconnects it, uh, one of the things we talked about, if you want to just slide that screen down just a little bit, Jace, on the computer. There you go. On the th on what we were talking about earlier was the actual, when we we're talking about monitoring the voltage or monitoring the system, is that we don't have a lithium polymer battery actually dropping uh, voltage down the whole time she maintains a near 50 volts until on the bottom left of the screen we can see 84 percent of the hydrogen that is left over that is the tank pressure basically and we can see that displayed in bars with, an, with something that gives us a, a, a equatable in a percentage of how much is left in the tank uh, once we get down to a certain low bars, of course, that means our tank is getting empty, but the production of that voltage is still coming. One of the other things about the production is uh, as the fuel cell is active and running and uh, producing voltage, you have a byproduct called water. So on the bottom of this, there's actually water outlets in which are dr it's dripping water out of the uh, actual unit, the, the fuel cell units. Two of them are inside. And so as we look at uh, good production of voltage from the hydrogen, we're, it, we have to monitor it this way. Traditionally, and again, as JT had mentioned, we could take this uh, system and put it on anything that can hit this wattage as well as voltage output. And then from there, uh, we have a way to make sure we're not running out of hydrogen before we're supposed to. And, and again, we have uh, complete voltage output. Uh, these fuel cells, again, are generating 25 volts each so, yeah. yep, and running in series with each other. Yeah. 
And so if there was any technology that could add more voltage if needed, you could probably add more fuel cells. I mean, we're just talking that capability. And again, we talked again about packing more molecules into a space, you know, to be able to drive a bit more time. So if we scroll down on this screen right here, just a little bit further, we have a couple of other things that we can see. The power output in wattage, we can see that number going from zero to 36 to nine. This is the ship just sitting there right now, consuming a bit of, of uh, uh, watts while she runs. But she should be outputting approximately 2,000 watts while she's flying around. So again, that is gonna be the consumption of the machine at that given time but this fuel cell can easily produce 2,000 watts. Uh, and did we see Lance as we added weight or put weight, that wattage jumps a little bit? I mean, slightly. it's slightly, a little bit. I mean, it jumps enough to give it, like I need to produce a little bit more because now I'm, I'm carrying more. So totally makes sense there that we're monitoring that, watching it and doing that. So uh, this is just a screen again that helps us uh, monitor the um, temperature of the, the system, voltage. We do have onboard packs. There is onboard battery packs. Uh, yeah, go ahead and shut that down, Lance, and we'll bring that back inside. So there's also onboard battery packs that are also shown on this display. And uh, just in case the bird actually does not want to produce hydrogen, I'm gonna say you probably have about 60 seconds about 60 seconds to go ahead and uh, land that bird in a uh, emergency fashion. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, let's go. Do we want to do that? Do we have a, a camera? I don't even think we have the actual camera. If he turns on the camera out there, we can do it. Okay. All right. So uh, kind, of a, kind of an explanation over all, all of that. Again, how we monitor it. Um, this can be done through on this particular system. Again, not caught up too much on the flight controller, but the A3 flight, flight controller is what is on this ship, the uh, DS-30. The DS-30 has an A3 flight controller inside, and while it's inside, uh, we also have that uh, uh, monitoring of the hydrogen coming through on the API. So uh, let's go ahead, yeah, let's go ahead and uh, just have Lance uh, after power down watch and uh, see how the actual power system is removed. So he has got a couple of latches on there in order to remove either the tank or even remove the whole system. But right now he's disconnecting the hoses that have an air input in and dripping water out. After that disconnect, we can remove the system with the hydrogen connected, but you know, we want to be very cautious when we're doing this here, but uh, there's a couple of clips on the front end. And with the hydrogen connected, he can lift it right off, and there is our battery system. Basically, our hydrogen battery system. So a pretty, a pretty fairly easy system as far as removal, take it back on. Uh, there is actually a, a bracket here in which we can make a little bit larger if we wanted to, to go ahead and test the uh, lithium polymer versus the hydrogen. So just with a simple output, I can go ahead and do that. Uh, let's go ahead and bring that over here. Lance, I'm gonna get, move this tank out of the way. Thank you, sir. And then we'll want to get the other camera real quick so that maybe we can show a little bit more of what's kind of on the inside of this thing. So we have an access panel right here that uh, allows us to uh, disconnect, a connect, uh, disconnect a connector as well as the hydrogen tank inside. Uh, and that connector monitors the pressure of the tank. So that's what's giving us the uh, how many bars are in the tank left over as we're using it, as well as the uh, overall uh, percentage that, uh, that it kind of gives you on what is left in the tank. So after disconnecting that, and as well as the uh, uh, what you call it system, we're gonna go ahead and show a little bit closer on that. So I'm gonna remove the, the tank here. It's got a little safety clips here to uh, hold the tank in. 
Once those are kind of removed here, and I'm gonna grab my flashlight for our camera guy here, Jeff Flowers running our camera. And we'll get a little bit closer up here if we can see that. Exposure. Oh, maybe, maybe we'll get a little closer. <laughs> no, we just need to adjust our exposure. Okay. Jace, our cameraman doing his thing. Uh, inside, one thing about it is, again, we have two uh, lithium polymer battery six cell that are actually running, running the system. And uh, if we take a look at that, you know, we can see where, this, where the front of the tank is right here. There's a, a connection up on the front end and uh, this portion here up on the front, a connection on the front end and then a hard connection into the tank itself. So um, we can see that. So I'm just going to remove the tank here, hand this over to Lance. So he can take it out and then we'll kind of talk a little bit closer up on the tank. Come on over here, Lance. So on the valve itself, you know, this, this is again a developed, a developed uh, uh, tank created and made by Dusan. Uh, up on the front, we actually have an open and close. So I'm going to close the actual valve here to make sure that it doesn't push any hydrogen through even if we press the little thing on the top here. And then this connection right here that's on the top is what is giving us the uh, pressure and, and valve pressure. So uh, not much to it, huh? Nope, no. pretty simple. Pretty simple. Uh, okay, inside, and we're gonna just flip it this way, and hopefully we can see a little bit on this uh, with the flashlight. So right here uh, is one fuel cell, and there's one identical on this other side. Once it's uh, starting to produce, there's a number of lines that come on the inside that then push that voltage out to the main connectors, which are on the bottom of the machine, uh, just right there. So we've got a positive and a negative. Uh, nice thing about this is it does actually have an API connection that runs through the uh, flight controller to then show us uh, what this, this system is reporting. So not when we have to, again, take a take a look at the hydrogen overall and what it's producing, make sure it's not getting hot. There's actually an API control that pushes out to the uh, uh, actual app in which I can monitor it that way too, so as a pilot. Um, and again, the procedures are, are slightly different. Internally and uh, on the side here, we can see just on the side, we can see there's a, there's a little battery on the inside there. There's two of them. <coughs> These are six cell. 2600 milliamps and with this we have the ability to possibly run out of hydrogen <laughs> these are also to uh, and keep it flying and then these are also the initial power up to power up the bird so that the bird starts the process of converting hydrogen over to electricity so that's a uh, that actually does work out pretty well as far as uh, how compact everything is on the side of this just to keep the fuel cell sections uh, basically cool, I have a number of cool sections right there. And uh, you can see the fans on the side here and everything else. Okay. So anyway, that's kind of a, kind of a, kind of a brief walkthrough of the actual unit itself. Not a, uh, a major, uh, uh, if you want to call it development, to uh, create this, but to get it this small, Absolutely a big deal. Try, kind of a big deal to get this small enough and working well enough to uh, be put on today's UAS and uh, developing ships around it. So uh, definitely a uh, kind of a kind of a neat thing. Any questions, Jace? We tell me we got some questions. We do. We have a few. Okay. Uh, let's see here. We're gonna go through a couple of these real quick. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, obviously, uh, something that uh, is a piece of interest is refueling. How can you do it? Where can you do it? What does that very, kind of very, ecosystem look like? Very, very good question. As far as the logistics behind filling the hydrogen tanks. So, uh, one more time. I'm going to grab this tank behind me. Uh, the one thing about this, you know, pushing it out to 350 bars is that uh, when we had uh, went ahead and set up the uh, refueling of this or initial fueling of the tanks, uh, Dusan brought a, a trailer that was actually developed by them, 
had a low pressure and high pressure uh, system inside to fill the tank, uh, but it wasn't as easy as going to the nitrogen store, uh, the hydrogen store, the gas store. Uh, what is that store called, JT? Oh, come on over. The, yeah. the, what is the store called? Uh, air gas or anything else? We're not just going to run down there and just, yeah, and let, just fill well, that there's, tank. There's actually three solutions for this right now. Uh, currently, they're able to ship tanks. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, uh, I'm not on the mic anymore. You're good. So um, they're able to ship these through the UPS. Uh, it's a lot better to order a pallet at a time uh, for economies of scale. Mm -hmm. uh, the second way is to actually what they call cascading, taking the current, uh, current tanks of hydrogen and putting them in. That isn't really preferred. And the next way is to actually fill up the hydrogen in a uh, the trailer that John mentioned, yeah. where um, you're able to get uh, a number of tanks and fill them up at one time. Uh, we can facilitate all of those. Uh, the goal is to have uh, these available all over the country. The easiest way to do it right now is definitely, if you were to buy a machine, is to have the uh, tank sent to you on a pallet. Um, generally, the cost of the hydrogen per tank is about sixty dollars. Sixty dollars. Yeah. yeah. So you can you can kind of do the flight time sixty dollars divided by what is that uh, one hundred twenty minutes. Yeah. You know you can kind of figure out what the uh, cost of that is. Actually, um, actually, we have done that, and it's uh, like eighty percent less for a set of batteries versus one set. And True. this this is again yeah, the, the other, this is this is pushing against these. Yeah. Not necessarily a small Mavic battery or a DJI compared 210, to those, yeah, it's a but compared better. to this, yeah. it's seven hundred and fifty dollars a battery yeah. times four and degradation over time. You definitely have a huge uh, difference in uh, cost. Yeah, and I think that the way we see these being deployed right now is probably you know is it something you're going to travel with? Probably not. This is something that is going to provide long flight times potentially uh, away from areas that even have power. Mm -hmm. So you can tow the hydrogen tanks out there or leave them on site, fly the drones where you don't have any access to power to recharge batteries. This is another a great solution. So, yeah, well, you bring up a great point here. Something that might come up in a discussion here is we're talking about pretty intense equipment meant for a purpose, not just something you just throw up like you would on a lot of these other UAS. I mean, we're, we're sh we would have to move the machine out to an area hydrogen out to an area. We have a great use cases for that, but it isn't going to be one of those quick deploy, no, no, you this, know, this overall. Further, yeah, yeah. It, this, we're not talking throwing on an airplane and cinema You're going to have to have a facility where you, you have the, it stays. the drones on site, mm -hmm. um, where you, you have a place to safely store the hydrogen, um, you know, and then uh, you'll be able to, you know, maneuver with probably putting this this type of equipment in some sort of vehicle to get out to the launch site mm -hmm. or carrying it there sure but yeah the, the idea of putting this in a small case and you know getting on an airplane isn't really that applicable to this at this point uh i don't know if you'll ever be able to carry hydrogen on well airplane, it's not it's but, not it's not the, but it's a, it's definitely one of these things where for our you know larger industrial type customers that have you know remote mining facilities that have uh, railroads power facilities that are you know power lines that they may not have access to power or they're out in an area where they want to be able to fly long distances for, mm -hmm. you know this is a, a great solution for that not to mention you know there is no there's no recharge time if you were to have you know potentially 12 tanks of hydrogen you have 24 hours of you know continual flying flight yeah yeah excellent excellent any other questions jace that was kind of an elaboration of that last Sorry. one but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's good yes Let's see, we've got, we do have some more here. Um, how does air temperature affect the hydrogen system uh, as opposed to like LiPo systems or something like that? Excellent question. How does the freezing cold or the extremely hot conditions affect hydrogen operation? Well, we had said earlier that it drips water. Uh, the way the current configuration is set up that we certainly don't, we cannot fly at less than 32 degrees, the way this is set up. Now that has already come up in a number of questions already with our internal staff actually, like what if somebody wanted to fly it in less than 32 degrees or zero uh, Celsius and it gets to the freezing temperature, what would happen? Likely the, the lines would get all uh, choked up with ice and uh, wouldn't be able to, to push the thing out. But the other fuel cell development systems that I've seen out there, actually have lines that are warmed up, uh, they're heated to uh, actually extend that capability. How the fuel cell performs, 
I don't know if that's going to change much other than the exiting of the actual fuel or the uh, water. Uh, but in the extreme hot side, I'm hoping to keep it cool with fans and everything else that uh, as the fuel cell operates, uh, we're not pushing to extremes on that other end. So I could see it being more of a problem in cold weather and making sure it's doing what it's supposed to than it is in, in extreme hot weather uh, because of the byproduct water being produced. So that could be a problem freezing or or having a, an issue in the cold weather. But very good. that's a very good question and something that in development we may need to answer down that road of putting UAS and putting them in these uh, extreme conditions if we do. So. Cool. Uh, jumping into our next uh, piece. Uh, are the systems uh, designed the way they're designed um, able to fill uh, in the same way that the hydrogen cars are refilled because there are there are systems in place infrastructure for hydrogen fuel cell cars is that something that would be compatible well uh, you know JT can come and talk about it but at the same time we have the the thing is that this is highly pressurized that's it's exactly that's what I was it's say. not fuel hey. It's it, not, we're not burning yeah, fuel. I'm always off. Yeah. yeah let's, I'm trying to stay Quit away. Quit hugging me. Sorry. Yeah, maybe back. <laughs> go a little bit further. I'll just not talk to you. Um, it's the pressure thing. Um, the, what John mentioned on the trailer is the pressurization that takes place in this. Uh, what does it say on the tank? 350 there? bars. Yeah, yeah. 350 bars. What, what is, is that? that? In, 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 That's ESI. 350 times the uh, pressure of our current pressure, which push this is about three five thousand psi. Yeah, so that's the big issue. Is it's not as simple as uh, you know the refueling stations. Um, the goal would be to get to that point, but at this you know on this stage, the the three solutions are you know the the trailer actually has two large tanks that you can fill uh, via the uh, refueling stations, and then you'd use that to then fill these tanks because it's a separate uh, pressurization system that has to take place to yeah. put the pressure in the tank. So a little bit different technology than actual using hydrogen on a, on a, in a liquid form versus a uh, actual gaseous form. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't do that. We have to, we have to actually pre-pressure pre these before doing that. Uh, just to give an idea of the volume here, on the tank we're running 10.8 liters of volume that has been pressurized inside this. So 10.8 liters of volume. Cool. I would assume as an addition, I mean, if it was something with the hydrogen cars with a lower pressure, mm -hmm. you're looking at less volume that translates into less flight time. Well, Is that fair to say? That's the value of having the, the Hydrogen is the, one of the lightest elements, so they have to push all those you know, right. atoms into a very small area, and that's why it's higher pressure. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and, and, I, and as I had explained earlier, like I said, as I explained earlier, instead of putting more fluid, we're able to put more pressure. If this could hold more pressure, 650 bars, we're talking a volume of almost 10 liters, and that didn't change this physical shape whatsoever. If we can keep that much pressure inside of this tank, it even increases our flight time because, again, hydrogen being so light, the lightest molecule in the world, uh, we can actually put more volume in here. It's like adding a bigger gas tank just by increasing the pressure in here. So, I was going to say, the lightest molecule, molecule in the universe. Oh, okay, good call. Good call. <laughs> <laughs> of, the known, of the known world universe. Of the known universe. <laughs> right. um, what, what are the... Comp or, God, I cannot speak. What are the replaceable components of a fuel cell? What could wear out? Mm. Very good question here. What, what is going to be the wearable portions of, of the fuel cell system between hydrogen itself, the tank, logistics to get it, uh, what you got doing, going on in the conversion? Uh, we don't actually know this very well, and the reason why. Dusan has done over a thousand flights on a system. One thousand flights, that's uh, many hours, two thousand hours on just one fuel cell system. Um, because of their technology and where they're at right now, uh, what does need to be replaced? Membranes and internal components, likely wires that are uh, uh, exposed to get chafed, uh, things like that over time. Uh, it's a really good question. What is going to be the replaceable parts and pieces? Uh, something that we 
uh, again, just need to keep using the technology to find out. Uh, we don't want to bring it to a failure point, but they've also got a really good team, Dusan that is, that definitely listens to all that input. They've got a great R&D team uh, and working on further developments on this. So I'm also curious on exactly that, what that would be, Jace, what that would look like on uh, replacing any, any parts and pieces that just degrade over time. One thing about lithium polymer batteries, and the big one about lithium polymer, is that once the capacity starts to drop below 80%, that battery's toast, you know? So the typical cycle times out of a lithium polymer to get to 200 cycles out of a, out of a LiPo battery, you're doing pretty damn good. Pretty good to get 200 cycles before you have to throw it away. If it's a $700 battery, 200 cycles, you do the math on exactly how many, how many times that flight is costing you when you put it up in the air. And we have degrading motors and magnets as well to consider when you're, when you're talking about the airframes and whatnot. So, but it's a really good question, Jace. Really good question. Indeed. And, and something, something that's still more or less developing sure. at this right. point. Yeah, it's, I mean, um, we're still you know. early in the game as far as putting, at least our team is, early mm -hmm. in the game of finding out how, what is going on when we have to do replacement parts and pieces uh, right. as we haven't really even hit that point yet. So, Okay. Cool. Um, then uh, another one. What's what's the usable shelf life of the pallet of bottles? What's uh, you know if you take an order of these cells, I'm assuming how long can you expect them to sit on a shelf, sit well, on a, a full a full shelf that uh, would still be usable? Sure. Let's let's talk a little bit about the science here. The the actual science. Uh, hydrogen is small. It's a very small molecule. It doesn't weigh very much. So the tanks even these are going to basically expel gas over time. <laughs> Neg negligible, small amounts, but it does leak through, uh, in the best terms, some gas that comes out of these. Very small, nothing to be super freaked out about, but how long does it take? Uh, we have to find out basically on metal acetylene type tanks, <laughs> those can sit for a little while, but they're gonna uh, create condensation. These are actually carbon wrapped and carbon made uh, I don't believe that there's any metal whatsoever in this tank except for the top. I could be wrong, but uh, how it's reinforced and what it is is actually all done with uh, composite materials. So um, how long can they sit? Well, we've had ours, how long have we had ours, Lance? Uh, we just put that bottle on today, almost uh, eight months. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, about eight months uh, that we've had them sitting there and uh, put them on and this one, this bottle that we put on today didn't instantly report 100% after eight months. She, I think, I think when I noticed when, you, when we put the fresh bottle right on there that has not been touched for at least eight months, I think she reported 90% to 95%, something like that. I, I just remember it didn't seem like it was like 100. If I so. remember right, it was November-ish? Yeah. But that, that'll also depend on how they filled the tanks too, right? I mean, when did they fill the tanks? Did they fill it to an exact 350 bar to give it the equivalent of 100% or is it just a safety zone of, of 90%? What so. happens to a LiPo if you leave it 100% for that? Yeah, what, yeah exactly. Uh, Lance brings up a good point. What happens if you leave a lithium polymer battery at 100% for eight months? Probably not going to come back to a good battery at all. So another good question uh, that we uh, definitely need to find out. How long can they sit, sustain, and, uh, and hang out before you use them? So. No, I think again, I think there's a, we have two different uh, part numbers here. The DP30, that's this, and the DS30, which is the ship. Uh, those are two different part numbers that uh, basically Dusan makes. So even, even though it's the, D, every, you know, we've uh, shown it on a website and talk about it as the DS30, this is the DP30. What can we do with the DP30 uh, and what can we put it on? What are the systems that uh, would be able to handle the 50 volts currently, the way this is set up, 2,000 uh, watts if it needs it, however, however many amps uh, we need to push out, uh, what can handle that? And additionally, the, the ship has to actually handle the size of carrying both, uh, you know, this, this weight uh, all together. So if we were flying again on the DS-30, uh, we're hitting these, the ex extreme amount of flight times with nothing on the bottom. But those, those are questions that are like, where can we put this? And uh, we're hoping at RMUS to actually have a little bit more 
development and working on that portion of it to try and see what other ships and parts and pieces we can convert to, to uh, run hydrogen and, and use that technology. Uh, with the input, of course, to uh, Dusan to improve um, and make it better, uh, that's, that's what we do here. So uh, anything else, uh, Jace? No, I think uh, unless someone can push something through real quick. Uh, Any other questions? Um, it watching Facebook, I'm watching YouTube. I think that's most everything we have. Yeah. As far as questions go. Uh, what, are, what are we talking on cost here, JT? On, I mean, when we're talking like just a full system like that, it's approximate. It's not necessarily, I mean, it's something that like people ask that often. You know, how much is that, you know? I mean, we're talking like, you know, a developed piece of equipment like this that is going. Uh, and then again, a bit of logistics. I mean, we can run from anywhere from what to what on something like this. Yeah, I, the fuel cell is about 40 to 50,000. Uh, and then, you know, the decked out, you know, that ship with uh, a thermal camera on it or different types of payloads is probably, you know, starting at 80,000. Mm -hmm. You know, it, you can go crazy. So it's, it, it, it's something to understand, basically, yeah. is all I'm saying is that it isn't this type of this right here is, a, is obviously a lot more expensive when it comes to initial purchase. Over time, it might actually come down to an equivalent of what it would cost for lithium. But it is an expensive investment initially. And uh, the ships themselves are not the, is obviously not the expensive part. $40,000 $40, for a, uh, a propulsion system, voltage outputting, ten to $15,000 yeah, for a ship. The value is in the, the, the duration of the flight time. Yes. And not having to have electricity if there's, you know, in your, in a remote area. Um, and, you know, different types of payloads that may require the, you know, flight times that just don't exist yet. Sure. Talk about like some of those payloads a lot. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, we could talk about a lot of the different payloads that run, you know, under the, this developed DS-30 uh, and DP-30, a LiDAR, for an example, and that's probably, I know that there's a, a lot of development, uh, i just seen a recent post about that, about somebody that it, uh, made a, a larger, bigger machine and, and with a 7-pound LiDAR is getting 30 minutes, uh, and 30 minutes of data collection on a LiDAR is actually pretty extreme. That's most of the lidars are developed to actually be on manned aircraft overall, um, and if you can fly it even that much longer and collect that much more data, uh, even the before and after calibrations and everything that goes on. So lidar is probably a really good example of a of a payload that would uh, take advantage of both flight time and uh, where it's at yeah, in so the world. That would, that would really be able to yeah. leverage. Leverage this yeah, this leverage development. That, the capability yeah. of that system. You can what also about go the flip side of that and go a very very light payload where you have a camera or a thermal camera where you're getting a, a long duration flight time for security and surveillance. Yeah, so I was just gonna say that I was gonna say when you're looking at security, surveillance, uh, Overwatch for uh, any any things going on with police stuff. Um, we talk about a lot uh, doing tethers on machines. Uh, tethers uh, are sometimes not capable of again of fl flying and moving from a position, but if they could, uh, you could have a, a machine that stays up in the air for a very long amount of time and still is able to to uh, reposition into into spot. So even security, uh, like like JT had said, and uh, uh, police, fire, all of those things could be uh, definitely used for this. Yeah, so. I think one of the, you know, you have to look at the, the cost of being able to charge the batteries and having people to help with, you know, remote operations. Uh, if you're out in the field, it's very quick to switch to hydrogen tanks. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, that, good, so a value to that, so. that's a good point. I didn't ask Lance about that when we were outside. So if we do a, uh, a hydrogen, basically a hydrogen switch, we're not having to power down the whole system. We're just able to, pull one tank out and put another tank in, mainly because those other batteries that are still running the actual flight controller and everything else. But, but it's basically hot swappable, is it not? I mean, in the, in the basic terms, mm -hmm. hot swappable system in which that can just keep running. So it's, uh, and it only takes, you know, 30 seconds to do, you know, to change them. So uh, uh, you probably run out, what were you saying? You would probably run out of radio battery before you ran out of, uh, uh, hydrogen producing capability. <laughs> good point. Very good point. But it's easier to charge the radios remotely than it is, you know, 50 volt batteries. Sure. Me. E easier to charge the radio. Yep, absolutely. Anything else, Jace? Uh, how are we looking on time? Uh, we're okay. I mean, we're, we're probably, probably about.
ready to to wrap it up i think ultimately kind of what we're talking about is uh one of our other commenters said it's no park flyer yeah, no i think <laughs> i ultimately i think the the point of it is is that part of it's the investment but part of it is is the capabilities of the platform is that this is a purpose-built platform the idea is we have this job that we need to do and we need to do it this way and it needs to be in this type of duration and to be able to accomplish that we're looking at a machine that is something like this this is kind of the idea uh, that you're looking at is i have this one i have this goal